now like to call to the stage a special, our special guest, Maurizio Giuliano, the director of the UNIC from Rio de Janeiro, to introduce himself and talk about his experiences. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Principal, Mr. Wagner, thank you very much for uh, helping the students invite me. And uh, then, uh, Madam Secretary General, Your Excellency, Mr. President of the General Assembly, uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, when I first received this invitation, well, I felt obviously that, for the reasons that I will mention in a second, it was very important to participate at this kind of event to encourage the interest of young people uh, in the work of the United Nations. At the same time, uh, uh, my memories went back to the time when I was at university uh, at Oxford in the UK, and I also participated at least once, maybe twice, uh, in a Model UN exercise. At the time, I was uh, the representative of Cambodia uh, with some uh, rather heated debates uh, on, uh, you know, with our neighbor, uh, Vietnam, and also um, trying to um, to cope with the, with the past, um, which as you knew, uh, at that time, uh, Cambodia came out of a very dark period. Uh, so um, I, I'll try to be short, even though being short is not one of my skills, partly because speaking is part of my, uh, my work and partly because I'm originally Italian, and you know the Italians do speak a lot, but uh, I'd like to, to leave some time for, for questions. So, um, what, what, you know, how did I uh, get to, to the UN? So, I, I studied um, politics, philosophy, and economics uh, from uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, then I did a master at Cambridge in uh, Latin American studies. Uh, after that, uh, I worked briefly for Oxfam GB, uh, which, as you know, is a major NGO uh, in the UK. And it was at the age of 25 that uh, I got my, I made, I first stepped into the UN system as a UN volunteer in uh, the territory of East Timor, uh, which at the time was uh, occupied by Indonesia, even being uh, on paper um, still a part of Portugal. And um, basically I, I went there as a freelance journalist, which was my pretext to be around the world. I knocked on the do different doors, and a few months later I was hired as a UNV in uh, East Timor, which is today the country of uh, Timor-Leste. I had the privilege at that time of working in a major UN mission, UNTAED, United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor. Uh, one of the few missions together with UNMIC in Kosovo that has actually been in charge of actually running a country uh, in the lack of a government. And I also had the privilege of working under the leadership of uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello, which, uh, as you probably know, is the most important uh, Brazilian uh, in the UN system, was the most important Brazilian in the UN system, who tragically got killed in Baghdad on uh, 20 August 2000, and gosh, I'm gonna get it wrong here, but 2003, approximately. Uh, while, um, and, uh, and that was a major loss um, to, the, to the UN system. Uh, after that, I continued um, a bit uh, doing freelance work as a writer, as a journalist. Uh, then I had other short-term experience in the UN system uh, with IOM, with UNDP. And then I joined properly as a staff member in 2005. Uh, my path until now has taken me uh, to a total of uh, 14 countries, uh, including Brazil, uh, some for as long as three years, uh, some for as short as uh, two, three months, uh, all presenting different challenges. The, the UN plays a crucial role, and I think that having worked, uh, in my case, in situations that go from uh, conflict or post-conflict situations, including Mali, Eastern DR Congo, uh, Timor-Leste, as I mentioned, Afghanistan, uh, to development uh, situations. Um, well, at the time when I was in Central African Republic, it was a development situation, even though it backtracked into conflict. Uh, to countries like Brazil and also Mexico, uh, which are doing relatively well on development. Uh, this, I think, gave me a, a fair idea, um, if, well, I hope, uh, of um, the importance of our work in very, very varied settings. Uh, we live in a world which is uh, globalized, and I think that uh, all of us here, I'm sure, believe in this uh, globalized world. And I'm, I, I, I very much uh, um, like your comments about uh, bubbles, uh, because, yeah, many of us, I mean, I was a, a bubble myself, and um, 
we, we have to, uh, to think outside the box. We have to look outside uh, perspectives of other country, perspectives of other people within the same country. Uh, in any case, um, the work that the UN does, uh, as the current Secretary General emphasizes a lot, is a lot about prevention. Uh, you know, he's using this, uh, this term a lot, but it's not something new. Um, the UN uh, prevents uh, things from happening. Now, why am I saying that with this particular emphasis? Well, because um, when we get criticism about uh, the UN is not doing enough, or the UN is not doing, is not doing that, well, about uh, a, year, a year ago, when I first started my time in Mali, uh, a deserted country landlocked uh, in uh, Western Africa, uh, I, among my various travels to the field, I traveled to a uh, city, a town uh, called Kidal, uh, which is in the middle of the desert um, uh, with uh, no government, no state, and uh, where we have uh, a very hostile uh, natural environment, meaning that you know, no water, no infrastructure, and at the same time we have a very hostile political environment. Uh, just today or yesterday I got news that two more soldiers, two more of our peacekeepers uh, got killed in Kidal, which has been happening regularly for the last few years. And to me, um, it's difficult to describe it without photos, but um, to be just the fact that in a place like Kidal, in the middle of nowhere, facing dangers, we are there, we are the eyes and ears of the international community, is already an achievement. We are not preventing conflict. We're not even able to protect ourselves from being killed by radical groups, by terrorists, by others. But the question is, I mean, what would happen in a place like that if the UN had not been present? Uh, we don't know, and we're not going to do the test of leaving in order to find out. But I think we can reasonably infer that had the UN not been present, were the UN not present today in those parts of uh, Mali or in South Sudan or in Eastern DR Congo, uh, the situation would be a lot worse, a lot, a lot worse than it is now. And I think that the same goes for development. I mean, what is the role of the UN? Can we prove that the uh, increases in the Human Development Index in Brazil over the last 20 years are attributable to the UN having proposed the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. Well, it's difficult to prove, but I think that uh, academics have uh, you know, come up, again, with reasonable inferences of how these uh, objectives containing the MDGs and the SDGs have played uh, a key role. So, as I mentioned, I've uh, worked in a humanitarian context, development context, peacekeeping contexts, uh, and uh, I, well, I, I, I worked in uh, protection and when I was in Mali, which is, uh, without going into details, is quite related to our work on uh, our human rights, protection being the more operational side of how to promote, uh, promote human rights and uh, decrease abuses. And um, in every case, there have been challenges. Uh, of course, you know, our work is not easy. So anyone interested in a career in the UN, I mean, of course, we have to, um, especially now that the Secretary General and the GA, even before the Secretary General, are insisting on mobility, uh, we have to be aware that uh, anyone, or almost anyone working for the UN, would be required to work in places that are nice, like uh, I'm working now in Rio, but also places that are tough. So just in Mali, where I came from, uh, even though we were in a city, Bamako, that was relatively safe, it was very sad to get almost every week to get news of our colleagues, mainly military, getting killed in the north. Uh, seeing their coffins come through our compound, having to attend uh, funerals um, on a regular basis is not something that is, um, is pleasant. And uh, when I was in the Congo, uh, major, um, how to say, it, major emotional challenges. For example, uh, you probably have heard of the Lord Resistance Army, one of the most uh, deadly uh, groups uh, in, in the world. And uh, I was working at the time in public information, and uh, we had to make the problem visible of the loss of resistance army. And in some cases, we had to use human suffering in order to make the problem visible. Uh, so we had some ethical dilemmas. So for example, at one point, um, there was uh, a visit by the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, uh, accompanied by New York Times uh, and a number of other media, and I was in charge of the visit. 
And I came to know that in one of the clinics uh, run by MSF, uh, a very strong NGO that we work with very happily, uh, there was a woman whose lips and ears were uh, by the LRA. And so the ethical dilemma was, well, what do we do here? Uh, it is not nice to use this woman, but in the end, after consultations, etc., also, of course, with the woman involved and the doctors, we decided that it was worth taking the risk. And uh, the, that was on the front page of the New York Times, and only a few months later, Mr. Obama, uh, President Obama, announced that he would step up efforts uh, by his own forces, by American forces, to fight the DLRA phenomenon, which now, a few years later, is almost over, we hope. Uh, without going more into challenges, I, I think that uh, it is excellent that um, you, know, you have this event. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to uh, preach to the converted or force an open door uh, by telling you how important it is. Um, the work of the UN spans everything, uh, more and more things. And uh, you mentioned things that, are, um, that were standard from the beginning, such as, uh, um, such as peacekeeping, such uh, as controlling um, nuclear weapons. Uh, but at the same time, you mentioned the right of uh, people with other sexual orientations. And all that uh, is now on our table. Uh, it is not it's not easy because we have 193 members uh, many of whom have different views. Uh, not only North Korea may have a different view about nuclear weapons, but also when you talk about uh, the rights of people with other sexual orientations, we have a number of countries that, of course, uh, do not agree. It'll be really interesting to see what uh, the results are, the recommendations are from your various uh, councils. And um, I'm sure you'll be discussing uh, Syria, as I've seen, I think, somewhere, the situation in North Korea. And I think that uh, even being in a bubble, uh, you are still be able to think outside the box. Uh, you are uh, going to be um, in, the, in the place of uh, whether UN officials or representatives of member states, but you are not constrained by the actual politics uh, of those member states or by internal politics. So I'll, I'll really be interested in seeing how by thinking outside the box, uh, you, know, you, you will be able to come up with... Um, with recommendations uh, about Syria, about North Korea. Some of the, the two problems, among many, which seem to be the most intractable uh, just now. And now, there is a presentation here. Um, I, I won't speak too long. Now, I, I believe that most of you are between 16, 18, or something like that. So you're probably not yet um, thinking about um, a career in the UN. But I've tried to put together a few recommendations that, um, you know, about uh, what you may want to start with uh, if you think that you might want to work for the UN in a, in a few years from now. So we can, uh, so, uh, I mean, like I'm calling this early planning. Now, if you're planning to work for the UN, uh, in addition to uh, your, uh, the degree that uh, most of you will have uh, very soon from university, it is important to get a master's degree. Uh, uh, on paper, the UN does not differentiate between elite universities and uh, the poorest universities. So whether you studied at Oxford or at the University of Ouagadougou doesn't really matter. It might matter in the, in, in the eyes of some hiring managers, but uh, we can't possibly say, oh, well, that's a better university than the other. So uh, in order to properly get in, uh, almost everyone uh, should have a, a master's. Without a master, things are more difficult. You need more years of work experience, etc. And uh, yes, as you know, we have uh, six official languages, including two which are the working languages, English and French. So in addition to French, so in addition to English, I think it'd be very important, uh, and which is important for your life anyway, uh, for you to become fluent in French. I mean, you're all quite internationalized, so I think it won't be too difficult for you over the next three to five years uh, to develop some fluency in French. At the moment, uh, half or almost half of our work, uh, from Haiti to Mali to the Congo, Central African Republic, Chad, is in Francophone countries as well. Uh, but regardless of that, as a uh, UN official, as a diplomat, sort of, uh, you, you know, French is something that is uh, usually expected. And then, of course, there are other languages. I mean, at this particular moment, Arabic is in high demand. Uh, we didn't know. Um, 10 years ago that Arabic would be in high demand, so it's difficult to predict what, we, what will be in high demand uh, five or 10 years from now. But at the moment, it's, Arabic is, is a big advantage. We, uh, so we have uh, photos uh, showing uh, some of our colleagues from UNHCR in uh, different parts of the world. Minavo, that was in Congo. And uh, yes, you may want to start thinking, even if it's only thinking, about the occupational groups 
in which you might uh, want to work in. There are some which are generic and some which are specialized. So in my case, for example, I have my uh, feet in two boats. Uh, on one hand, I'm a specialist in public information, but on the other hand, I'm also a generalist, and that is why I worked as a head of a provincial office for OCHA, which is one UN entity in the Congo, and I worked as an advisor for protection of civilians in Mali. Uh, so there is uh, political affairs, human rights, legal affairs, humanitarian affairs, public information. Some of these do not require a specific uh, degree, uh, like political affairs, humanitarian affairs, public information, as long as you study something related to social sciences, international relations. Of course, if you were to work in legal affairs, you would need to be a lawyer. So, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, you shouldn't get obsessed now about working for the UN, but it's something to take into account. And you can find all the occupational groups online, and we'll have some links later. Uh, so we can go on. Uh, so that's, again, uh, our colleagues discussing with uh, IDPs in uh, Africa. And, uh, well, uh, th that will be not immediate, but uh, after your studies, uh, you should know that there are some formal uh, programs for entry-level applicants. Uh, we got the Young Professional Program in the Secretariat, and then in UNDP we got something called LEAD and so on in different agencies. Uh, and then, of course, you can also become a UN volunteer, like I did, um, from age 25, but they also set people a bit younger. Um, I want to go into these because we have links, and I assume you'll get a copy of this. So I guess we can we can move on and uh, cut it short. That's again our colleague. I'm sorry for the lack of captions, but uh, uh, that's uh, somewhere in Africa again, I think. So um, and then yes, this is also important for those of you who are planning uh, a gap year, maybe between now and university, or you may plan a gap year between university and working. Um, well. Um, Maybe you don't want to just now uh, drop by the current uh, hotspot, but uh, if you do it later, um, you know, Iraq, Sudan, Somalia, places now where the UN is really struggling to find people. So there are occasional moments, like after the earthquake in Haiti also, where the UN is struggling to find people locally. And uh, just showing up can be useful. Now, you're not gonna do this now. I wouldn't recommend that you, you go to these places, uh, but it's something that you may take into account. For your first gap year, uh, meaning if you're taking a year between now and university, I will focus on um, improving your languages, French, Arabic, others, and I will focus also on maybe doing some volunteer work with an NGO in a developing country, uh, something like that, because as I will say in the next slide, we, we, can, we can go on. Um, but yeah, we can, we can, we can move. Uh, yeah, don't be too optimistic on getting in without prior work experience, even though in theory there is a level called P1, uh, which requires no work experience. In practice, that doesn't actually exist. So uh, whether you do it in your gap year or you do it during your university studies or later, it is excellent if you can work or volunteer for a non-governmental organization. It could be in the favelas of Rio. It could be in the formerly FARC-controlled areas of Colombia. It could be in Africa, and many places in Africa are much safer than the ones I've been to. Uh, maybe do some academic work in a relevant field. Uh, government, uh, the institution in any relevant country. Uh, media, of course. Uh, so, uh, you know, by having experience, whether as a volunteer or intern in some of these fields, you're going to increase your chances. And that's something that you could also do in your gap year or end during your studies. I think, I think it's finished, except for the links. Now, I think that I don't need to, to read the links because you're gonna get a copy, but basically you can see that we have uh, different types of uh, job openings, and you can also go on because there are two or three more slides like that. Uh, as you know, the UN is composed of the secretariat, as you know quite well, and uh, apart from the other uh, principal and subsidiary organs of the, of the UN, then you have the, special, the uh, agencies, funds and programs, and specialized agencies, and affiliated bodies, et cetera, et cetera. Each of them have a different recruitment system, which is, uh, which is a bit unfortunate because you have to create applications in different platforms. Uh, but, um, uh, well, that is the way that it works for the moment. So you'll, you'll get a copy with these links. And even though you will not be applying now, I think it's use, good, useful to familiarize yourself. But uh, I don't know how long I spoke. I didn't uh, check, but uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'd be very happy to answer them. I guess, Madam Secretary General, I mean, uh, are you going to encourage any questions? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the UN is pretty much about uh, planning for our future. It's about wanting a better future. Uh, in Brazil, it's about uh, eradicating poverty. It's about decreasing uh, inequalities. It's about uh, the rights of indigenous people. It's about the rights of people from racial minorities. And, uh, and, and that, that is all really for, for young people, uh, for you, for your children, for your grandchildren. Uh, development is something that takes 10 years, 20 years. And uh, even though, as you said, you all come from a certain social class, uh, we all know that uh, better equity in the distribution of income and in uh, education is going to benefit the entire country. Uh, and uh, going beyond Brazil, well, um, you know, we, we have civil wars in uh, nine countries at the moment. Uh, and that is pretty grim. And the more that the Islamic State uh, gets hit, uh, the more we have terrorist attacks in Europe. And uh, people in Europe itself, and many of you are Europeans here, are pretty worried uh, about what the future is going to look like in Europe. Uh, so the UN is trying to tackle these problems. And uh, in my case myself, I'm concerned more for my children uh, than for myself. I think, you know, for the next 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, um, you know, I, I, I may have my things squared out. But um, it is really about the future. It's really for young people that uh, we're doing much of this. I mean, the environment, I mean, we could all, all of us in this room could live quite happily until we die uh, with the current environmental situation. Uh, we're not going to have countries underwater, except maybe for the Maldives in 50 years, according to some experts. Uh, we're not going to, to, to have global warming uh, be excessive. Uh, so if we're worrying about the environment, it's really for people who are not born yet. Uh, so that, that's, to me, the importance of generational concern uh, you know, about the, the future of this world. Yeah, are we done? Oh, one more question here, sorry. Is there a certain degree of elitism in the diplomatic community in the UN? No, there is no elitism, assuming that you're referring to social classes. Uh, however, uh, there is elitism inevitably because in order to get into the UN, uh, you need a university degree and ideally a master's degree. And unfortunately, while in Europe, um, in almost any country in Europe, everyone is on an equal, has an equal chance, to, uh, well, in theory, of getting into university, in a lot of places in the world, think of South America, but even worse in the least developed countries, not everyone has a chance of getting into university. Uh, the Syrians of your age, uh, who are now fleeing from Syria, who are in refugee camps in Turkey, in Jordan, or fleeing to Europe, don't have a chance to get into university. So uh, we don't want to be elitist, but uh, we won't be able to hire uh, people without a degree, uh, even understanding that it is not unfortunately their fault not to have one. So th I hope that answers your question. Okay. Are we, oh, there's, oh, there's more questions there. Um, okay, fine. You already saw a lot of things in the world and much of culture, different cultures. And I ask me, I ask myself, if you uh, to have a good life, a wise life, and a happy life, what is the most important thing that you think uh, you have a lot of experience in many cultures, and to have a good life, what's the most important thing? Well, you're asking a question which is uh, more personal than you're related, but. Uh, I think one, and a good answer to that question is that uh, the more you embrace uh, different cultures and diversity, the more you're likely to have a happy life. So um, I'm happy to be um, someone which is quite internationalized. I'm happy to have kids that have, uh, I guess, four or five nationalities. And, uh, and I think that uh, this is something very positive. Uh, it really brought in certain horizon uh, to um, to be able to understand different cultures, not only to understand them, but actually to embrace them. Uh, I'm very happy uh, because when I go to Afghanistan, uh, when I go to Zimbabwe, uh, when I'm in Europe, I feel at home. 
Uh, so I think the happiness in one way lies in uh, having the, the whole world as your home, being able to land anywhere and feel that's your home, being a citizen of the world rather than a citizen uh, you know, of uh, Brazil or Germany or another country. So that might answer your, your question about happiness, at least from, from my perspective. Uh, yes, uh, similar to other countries here in Brazil to, ha to become a diplomat, one must inform themselves or have a degree in a certain area, no matter what area it is. But in your opinion, if someone were to try to become a diplomat, what would be the best area for them to have a master's or to inform themselves more about? Yeah, you're talking about diplomats in a national civil service, in, you know, like not about in the UN, right? I guess both. I guess both. Well, I mean, I. I, I mentioned before um, about, about the UN. Um, about, I can't speak for a specific diplomatic service. Uh, all I can say is that, as you know, in, in some countries, uh, typically Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, the, the US, the UK, uh, you could have studied Latin and Greek, and then you can go on to do almost anything, as long as it's not like a doctor or a lawyer. Uh, in other countries, uh, typically South America, Southern Europe, uh, you need to be a bit more specific uh, in your studies, and people expect you to do something that's, that's closer. Now, this might change, uh, but uh, I've already went through it for as regards to the UN. Um, as regards to diplomatic service, it pretty much depends what country you're in, uh, and uh, you may want to talk to diplomats from, from there and figure out what they've studied, what their, uh, what their uh, you know, tracks have been, and, and so on. Wow, there are so many questions. Okay. Um, how do you, uh, as a professional, deal with coaches or people, representatives, which have opinions which conflict with your own morals or just human rights in general? How do you do deal with that in a professional way? Yes, I mean, that is a very, very, very important question. Uh, when I talk about my opinions, uh, I do, not just because I work for the UN, but I, uh, my opinions tend to be those of the UN, of the Secretary General. Uh, so yes, I mean, a good example is, uh, for example, about the rights of people with, uh, with um, minority sexual orientations. I and mean, what do you do, uh, you know, if you're going to try and uh, defend uh, their rights, uh, talking to senior officials from uh, Saudi Arabia who believe that they deserve the capital punishment? I mean, it's not... Uh, is not simple. Now, that was an extreme example, but um, I've also been in situations, more, most typically, uh, where people do not believe in gender equality. So uh, you work across Africa, and uh, you go to meetings, you want to meet the whole community, and uh, it is the men who speak. Well, when it is humanitarian work, uh, you just have to sometimes um, politely ignore that. Uh, you know, to the protocol, meet the men, etc. but say, well, we also want to meet the women. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, in a lot of uh, countries, when humanitarian aid is delivered, it is actually the woman who is in charge of receiving it. Uh, because the women, on average, statistically, are, um, is, uh, are believed to be uh, more understand, they believe to, to better understand the actual needs of the, of the household. And, and this is done, of course, it has to be done without disempowering men, which is also, uh, which also have to play an important role in the household. Um, so in, in some cases, you just have to politely uh, use an approach that, uh, that is uh, different from theirs. I mean, some people may be shocked that you're working with women more than with men, but uh, it's something that just you, you have to do. Um, in a place like Afghanistan, uh, of course, it was, uh, uh, it was not easy, uh, again, to talk to people who believe that women are inferior. I mean, you know, uh, maybe not the, the current elites, uh, most of whom were uh, either refugees or exiles. Uh, but a lot of people in Afghanistan just believe that. So, I mean, how do you go to a village, talk to the local mullah, and convince him that, uh, that uh, actually women are not inferior? Well, well you don't. Uh, maybe you're not going to be able to change their minds overnight, so you focus on the concrete problems. You focus, on, for example, on the issue of early marriage. Uh, because, by the way, in, uh, that's another example. In, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, when the UN was talking against early marriage, forced marriage, etc., well, people were not really paying attention. It was only when we convinced, or UNICEF specifically, some colleagues from UNICEF at that time convinced some local mullahs uh, to speak against early marriage that people listened. So you may not have convinced the local mullah that women are equal in, every, in each respect, 
but you convinced him to actually say something that empowers women, that enables them to move forward in society. So you try have to you know, strike a balance there. Yeah, but that was a very, very good question. Yeah, Madam Secretary, yeah, that's it. One more and that's it, yes. Okay. That's going to be me, I guess. Um, my question to you is, as you're an inf inform information specialist, um, what is your opinion about the media or the current media situation in the United States? Because most people are, you see a big difference between right wing and left wing and the division in that is very, um, not really obvious, but it's apparent. So is there, is there anything you can say to that about that? Because you're a specialist in information. Mm. Well, as an official, I'm not, I'm not going to comment specifically on media in the United States, but one thing that, uh, that I can say is that um, we, even we in the Western world, are subject to a lot of, um, uh, of media hegemony, if you like, to, uh, where certain views uh, always um, appear more uh, than other views. So, for example, while, while we all know that, uh, you know, North Korea appears to be uh, an evil country, and uh, the Security Council confirmed that, so I'm not disputing it, uh, I think it would be interesting uh, to know um, what, what they're saying, what their views are. Uh, the, all UN member states have unanimously condemned ISIS, but uh, there is a website uh, run by an NGO in the United States uh, which republishes for academic purposes uh, the ISIS um, magazine. And it's extremely interesting because you can see that uh, even though they are a terrorist group, even though they are an evil group, and no member state would disagree with that, uh, they actually have a rationale behind what they're doing. And if you want to fight a phenomenon like terrorism, you can't fight something without understanding it, without knowing it. You can't fight an enemy that you don't know. And that's why getting to see the other side of the story, whether it is what the North Koreans are writing, whether it is what the Islamic State is writing, is, uh, is really essential. Another example is, um, very openly in a reception in Rio a few days ago, uh, the Russian Consul General was talking about the Ukraine and was saying, well, this is all the result of a misunderstanding. And uh, well, it, it is unfortunate to think that so many people are dying because of a misunderstanding, so I'm not gonna comment on that. But uh, it, it is also interesting for me and, and a bit surprising that everything that we see in the media is uh, pretty much uh, anti-Russian when it comes to the Ukraine context. So I'm not going to comment. I mean, there are statements by the Security Council, by the Secretary General, I'm not going to speak for them. But one thing I can say about media is that I myself would be more interested in reading what is in the Russian media it, what do they think about it? Uh, because otherwise, I mean, how can we have an objective view of the situation? Anyway, I think the time is over. So thank you very much.